Hello and welcome to my second in the series where I'm building a tube-based guitar amplifier from scratch. Now in my first episode, I basically just went over why I want to build a tube-based guitar amp. And then I went through my basic design approach, which is a definition and a specification, and then a block out the design, then test and evaluate the design, then mock up and make changes, and finally build it out. Now in the second part of episode one, I set my end goals, and then I went through these differing goals to define even more and more bits and pieces that I would need to complete my project. And that kind of leads me to where we are today. So today I'm going to try to tackle the next two parts of my design approach, specification and blocking out the design. For me, the specification stage is basically where I come up with a preliminary BOM. Basically, I see what I have and what I'll need to order. Secondly, I'd have to see what I need to build. Are there any special circuits I have to design? Now, as I might have mentioned in my last episode, a block diagram gives you a high-level view of what your circuit is supposed to do. The circuit is broken down into functional blocks, and each of those blocks will have inputs and outputs. Now, these blocks are then organized and joined together following some sort of logical path. In my case, it's the input signal from the guitar to the speaker, which is the end output. You will, of course, in many block diagrams, have secondary inputs. In this scenario, it's the power input. And those are usually placed well over the way of the signal path or even on a separate page. Anyway, enough about general block diagram conventions. I am at the same time going to come up with a schematic, or at least a preliminary one. And I can update my BOM as I go along. Now, one of the main benefits of doing a block diagram and schematic together is to work out any potential problems before you go out and buy anything. Anyway, so let's get in with the process. So when uh, compiling the initial bill of materials, we want to go back to our definitions and pick out those components that can be easily defined. For example, the speaker. I won't be making one of those from scratch, and I can easily pull one out of one of my donor amps. Now I'd also need, of course, a power transformer. Now I had defined what I needed in a transformer fairly well in my first part, and it didn't take me long to go up to the Hammond website and find one that fits my needs. The uh, 166F120 has a center tap, converts 115 to about 120 volts, and has a 300 milliamp rating. So it's perfect for my needs. And it's not very expensive, and it also doesn't weigh very much. So we'll put that on the to buy list. Now I also said I needed two jacks, and I was thinking I could reuse some from the other amps I'm going to be scrapping out. But I had a look, and... So here I have the guts of my three uh, solid state amplifiers. Of course, the most expensive one is nothing more than a bunch of SMD parts. And what I'm looking for is jacks. And these are cheap, cheap, cheap little birdie jacks. Cheap, cheap, cheap. They are simple SMD mounts. No wonder these things break so fast. The board can break. This one is point to point, but then again, really cheap plastic jacks, even plastic screws, plastic everything. Ugh. Again, that's the second most expensive one. The cheap one from Japan, or China, I should say, the Typhoon brand, uh, has the best of the jacks, but then again, they're surface circus board mounts, so I can't use those. Oh well. So it looks like I'll have to be adding a couple of jacks to my order list as well. Next, of course, I want to add in a volume and tone control, so I'll need a pair of of pots for those two items and going back to my donor ants let's see what we can find pots here are just itty bitty little surface mount pots which are useless for me they don't even slide well oh well oh god they really really do a little birdie dance with these cheap 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 uh, same with this one really cheap little pots Though these are a little better. I mean, not pots, but... Those aren't pots. Those are... Yeah. And the last one, of course, is the same thing again. These are a little more beefy, as you can tell. Those are the standard ones. But I need something with a little more wattage. Because I'm dealing with high voltage. Or at least a little higher voltage than I would normally. So, uh... Nothing to scrap out. Okay, so there's some more items for the BOM. A brace of variable resistors to use as pots. Now for the power supply hookup, I can add 
a few more things to my BO arm, like a three prong plug, a double throw on off switch, and a fuse holder. And I think I can probably easily salvage those from any of the donor amps I have handy. Now I have passive components in quite abundance, but what I lack now are the actual values I need. So I actually have to do some design work to start specifying out what those will be. So why don't we start the block diagram? Here we have the basic input block. Now we know we have two channels coming in, normal and bright. And of course, what comes in on those is the input signal from the guitar, or as my dad would call it, noise. And next, of course, comes the output, which is just noise, either coming from the bright or the normal or both inputs at the same time. Now I can draw the first bit of my schematic, which are just two input jacks. I also make a note in my BOM that I want to buy stereo input jacks. Not that a guitar is a stereo instrument, it's just that many guitar amplifier chords are made that way. And it's better that I ground out the unused stereo side than have it as an open channel going nowhere. Now before I get too far along in the design process, I should give an example of how a tube or valve amplifier works. Now as I said in my last episode, a valve amplifier is one of the simplest circuits you can get. All we start with is at least a triode, next a resistor coming from the screen, and this is usually called the grid resistor or sometimes the grid stopper resistor. And next a resistor coming off the cathode, which is, oddly enough, called the cathode resistor. Now the purpose of this resistor is to keep the cathode more positive in respect to ground than the screen. Now the final component we add into our amplifier is the load resistor, or it's sometimes called the plate resistor. Now if we put a large DC voltage across the load resistor and onto the plate, this will set up conditions in the valve where any signal impressed on the grid will be greatly amplified by the plate. So let's go back to the schematic and add in our first passive component, a resistor here, which is the grid stopper resistor for the first valve. Now we just simply add in a second resistor here and hook them both up to the same output, and this part of the schematic is basically done. Now I haven't chosen a value for that resistor here, but I can get a good idea of what I need. I want my bright channel to have about half the resistance of my normal channel. Now not knowing what you need has never stopped an engineer from building anything in the past. We use the classic engineering technique called a guesstimate, or as engineers prefer to say, through inspection and experience, the value of the resistor was selected. In this case, I'm going for 200k for the normal channel and 100k for the bright channel. So now comes the black magic of working with valves, trying to select out the correct valves to use in my amplifier. If I go back to my definition stage, I know I want a single-ended Class A amplifier. My definition stage also states that I do not want a transformer that has heater taps coming out of it. I also only want to use octave valves, just to keep things simple, and I want to use ones that are cheap and available. Well, I happen to have five 50L6s lying around. As well, these are rather cheap. They usually go between five to seven dollars a pop. So there's my preliminary power valve chosen. Now I also want both a tone and a volume control. So that means I need both a preamp valve and an amplifier valve. I'll explain the technical reasons for that a little later on in the video. Now I could use a twin triode valve, but as anyone who's ever worked with guitar amps before, we know that any of the twin triodes used in guitar amps tend to be rather expensive these days. Fortunately our forefathers in the valve world face the same dilemma how to select the tube based on value and performance. And almost every old receiving tube manual out there will have a section on selecting tubes. So in my case, I need an octo tube. I don't need particularly high amplification, and my plate voltage isn't going to be very high. I also know I'm going to be using these valves as voltage amplifiers. So all I had to do was open up the receiving manual that gave a list of differing voltage amplifiers. I knew that I wanted a triode, and in this case, I wanted a median mu triode, meaning that I don't need a great deal of amplification, and I want a single unit valve. I also need a valve that has a high heater voltage. I'll explain the reason for that later in the video. And the 12J5 was the one that I found in the book. These are also cheap valves at about five to ten dollars a pop, and I've also got four or five of these. So there's my valves all selected. I'm also low on my tube socket supply, so I better order up some more of those as well. And now I can go on to my next block, 
the preamp. Now in my preamp, I know I have noise coming in from the input block. Now I also know in this block, I'm going to need another input, this time B++, which is the standard name we give to the DC voltage we apply to the plate of the preamp valve. Now this block is going to have some output, and in this case, it's more noise because we're amplifying the noise that's coming in. Now I can go back to this schematic and add in my first valve. We already seen the grid stopper resistor in the last schematic part, so we don't need to add that in. So next we'll add in the cathode resistor and the load resistor. Now I haven't worked out what the values of these resistors are at this point, but we do know that we're going to be needing half watt resistors in these locations, as they will have to handle higher voltages. So a couple more items for the BOM. Now this brings us to one other little resistor we have to add in. As we know, when the cathode is heated up, it will start emitting electrons that get absorbed by the plate, but they have to pass through the grid first. But every once in a while, an electron will actually hit the grid and not pass through. Now as these electrons build up, it's eventually going to cause you no end of trouble and cause such things as oscillation or loss of gain. So what we have to add in is a resistor to drain off these orphaned electrons. So we add in a large value resistor here going directly to ground so we can bleed off this excess voltage. This resistor is usually called the grid leak resistor. Now the value of this resistor should be large enough so that it does not interfere with our signal coming in. So usually we just pick one between one or two megs. Now to round out this part of the schematic we just need to add in one more component and that's a small value capacitor here. Now why do we need a capacitor here? Well, if you look at your typical amp cord, it's a big long spirally thing made out of wire, which is both a very large inductor and an antenna. So it will pick up unwanted RF noise. If you happen to be close to a high power AM station, you could probably pick up the AM station as well on your app, something we don't want. Now the 12J5 is a general purpose amplifier, so it will amplify radio frequencies as well as audio frequencies. So we have to filter out those radio frequencies, and that can be easily done because we've already got a good resistor. We add in a little extra capacitance with the capacitor plus the capacitance of the valve. We can tailor make our low pass filter and get rid of all that RF. So here we are at the next block, the amp. Now I know I have coming in more noise from the preamp, and of course I need some B plus or B plus plus. Then on the output, I have even more noise. So I can start with the basic building blocks of another 12J5 plate and cathode resistor. Next, I'm adding in a coupling capacitor. As the name suggests, this capacitor hooks one stage up to the next stage. Now its purpose is to stop DC from the previous stage from getting onto the grid of this stage, but allow the signal to pass through. Now, if you remember back to my last episode, I want to have a preamp and then a tone control. Well, this is actually wrong. At this point, I actually want the volume control. So here's a good example of where a block diagram in early schematic will help you catch mistakes early. Now the reasoning behind putting the volume control at this point in the amplifier is first, we know we've got a fairly strong signal. And secondly, we also know that the signal should only be audio as we've cut a lot of the radio frequencies off. So all we need to do is provide a direct path to ground to a variable resistor to bleed off any or all of the signal off the ground. Now we can go on to the next stage, the power stage. So like the other two stages, we have even more noise coming in. This time we have both B++ and B+ coming in. And then coming out, we have too much noise, as my dad would say. So back to the scheme again, and this time, where we start with our 50L6. And of course, the first passive component we had is a coupling cap to join this to the, to the previous section. Next comes our tone stack, which, which is a low-pass filter, where the resistor is a variable resistor which works in conjunction with the capacitor to cut off some of the high tones coming out of the amplifier. Next, we have a cathode resistor and also a cathode bypass cap. The cathode resistor is there, of course, to provide biasing, while the cathode bypass cap is there to send any unwanted frequencies to ground rather than having them amplified and come out of the speaker. Finally, we come to the audio transformer and the speaker. Now the audio transformer takes the place of a load resistor that we've seen in the previous stage. Now it's very important we match 
the impedance of the transformer to the impedance of the speaker, and likewise back into the impedance of the power valve. Now I'm lucky in my case in that I have a 3.2 and a 4 ohm speaker to choose from. So we'll have to see when I start doing the design which of the two values I'm going to go with. Then I'd have to buy the correct matching transformer for the speaker. Finally, the last thing to hook up is the B++ voltage for the green of the 50L6. Now we get down to our DC power stage block diagram. And all that really consists of is AC in, then B plus and B plus plus out. Of course, the schematic comes with your standard three prong plug, fuse, and a double throw switch. Next is the all important transformer, which I've already added to the BOM. And then finally, some sort of bridge rectifier. Now I haven't put anything specific here because I don't really know what I'm going to use at this time. I also need some filtering caps, but I have lots of those in my inventory. Now on to the last block, and that's the simplest, it's the heater stage. And basically all I have here is AC coming in, which goes to the heaters of my differing valves. Now going back to the schematic, you can see that I hooked up the valves heaters in simple series. Now one thing that the boffins that have come before me have worked out, a valve heater will only draw its rate of wattage or, as it's expressed here, voltage. Now it's expressed as voltage in valve world, so you can select out valves that add up to about 117 volts. So if I was using a fourth valve as a rectifier, I'd select one that would have about a 35 voltage heater, which in combination with the voltages of the other heaters would give me about 109 volts, which is fine for anything from 110 to about 120 volts off the AC main. Now I'm not using a, a diode, so I have to substitute out the missing heater voltage with a resistor. And of course it has to be a very high wattage resistor. So another thing for my BOM. Well, we're almost done for today. Now all I have to do is assemble the full block diagram by just taking my blocks and putting them together in logical order. And now all I have to do is join up all those bits and pieces of my schematic, and there, that's done. Now you will notice in my schematic there's some rather vague areas, such as down here near the, by the bridge rectifier, as I haven't picked out a rectifying topology yet. I'll save that for the prototyping stage. Now besides the two values for R10 and R9, I haven't picked any other values for any of my passive components. As a matter of fact, I might be dropping some passive components. There might not be a need for that C10 capacitor. Or I might want to go with a different form of biasing for that first valve and get rid of the cathode resistor, increase the value of C10, and really increase the value of R8 and use something called a grid leak shunt to bias the valve. So there's lots and lots of options and lots still do. So stay tuned when I actually sit down and try to prototype this system out. Goodbye for now. What is it? What is it, Riley? Oh, did you get a box? Did you get a box, Riley?